Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad that we got a few of you back from lunch. Not everybody. I see some more people rolling in. So uh, my name is Chris Kubeka. And for those who don't know me very well, I deal a lot with cyber warfare incidents. And I've handled a few of them uh, from North Korea versus South Korea, from Iran versus Saudi Arabia, and a few others in between and before that. Uh, my background is I used to actually head the information protection group for the Saudi Aramco family, and I was uh, the person called up to establish uh, their security, digital security posture worldwide, and it was myself and my team that reconnected their international business operations back in 2013 because it took them a while to get recovered. Previous to that, I was uh, in the Air Force uh, because... Uh, when I was a kid, I was busted for hacking into the Department of Justice at the age of 10, and when I was allowed to use a computer again at the age of 18, I was recruited by the Air Force. <laughs> so this is uh, going to be a story about an incident, a very interesting incident that occurred when the Royal uh, Saudi Arabian Embassy of The Hague was hacked by an insider. And there were multiple incidents that occurred with this particular incident. So we had someone getting in between the email communications of the official back channel uh, email account for the Saudi Arabian embassy. There was also a what I like to call a commercial off-the-shelf uh, root kit that was used by a nation state unbeknownst to an insider who was an ISIS friendly. There was an extortion demand that almost shut down the city very privately. Uh, because of the particular risk that was involved. There were also uh, a lots and lots of lives. Over 400 lives were actually threatened. In addition to that, uh, the incident spread to most of the embassies, even further than the 20 that you see on there. And it was so bad that several embassies actually put a disclaimer on their website stating that there was a, a cyber event uh, because uh, of this particular incident. So there were certain reasons why I was chose to head this, because I am not a Saudi Arabian national, and it's rather unusual for a non-citizen to be leading an incident inside a Saudi Arabian embassy. Now, uh, some of the reasons were I was already heading the information protection group for Saudi Aramco family, including the joint intelligence uh function, the knock and the sock, I also manage those. I have extensive experience in incident response. Uh, I also have experience with forensics, and we had a full chain of custody and forensics uh, set up over at Aramco in The Hague. Uh, I have a lot of experience, good and bad, mostly good nowadays, uh, with law enforcement relationships. I'm very good at communicating, so I can talk lots of tech because I'm quite technical, but also on a fairly regular basis, I'm talking to ambassadors, to ministers, and so forth as well. And at the time, there was some politics involved. We have this particular right-wing chap called Hurt Wilders in the Netherlands who had produced a, a video supposedly ripping up the Quran, and it pissed off a lot of particular countries in the world, including Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia, because of Hurt Wilders, actually canceled over a billion euros worth of contracts from Dutch companies and asked a lot of Dutch nationals to actually leave Saudi Arabia. So they did not want a Dutch person handling this particular incident. So one thing to understand about an embassy is it is not your regular commercial property. Uh, local laws do not apply. It is part of this sovereign country of that particular country. It is their property. And you can't just call up the police because they have zero jurisdiction. Now, the diplomatic corps do have some say in what happens law enforcement-wise for um, embassies, but not that much. Basically, the ambassador is the king or queen of that particular embassy in that country. So... I did say that there were additional incidents involved in this particular matter. And one of them was uh, the particular insider that I'll, I'll discuss in a bit um, was actually, unbeknownst to him, 
Uh, he thought he was an ISIS friendly, but he was actually being uh, controlled and led by the Iranian government, who used commercial off-the-shelf malware to uh, basically use what is called plausible deniability. If you are a nation state and you produce, with lots of research and development, a custom tool, once you use that tool, that tool is burned forever. So it is much easier for plausible deniability to use something and modify it commercial off the shelf and get it to the particular person that you're trying to control. Uh, at the same time that this all was happening, um, my office was not in the embassy quarter of The Hague, and uh, the we have strong suspicions that the Iranian government uh, helped finance completely the Yemeni government purchasing the building right next to us because all of a sudden they purchased a very expensive building with cash. Uh, in addition to this, we caught the many embassy employees coming into our building, pretending to be employees, coming into our uh, lunch canteen. We also caught uh, embassy officials digging in our backyard, our property, to try to get to our fiber to surveil it. So we had a lot of problems with the building next to us. Uh, in addition to that, I always like to say you never forget the first time you've been droned. Uh, over here in the red is the uh, embassy of Yemen, and right next to it is where my building was, my office was, so right next door in The Hague. And one afternoon, I'm speaking to uh, my boss, and he's sitting at his desk. I'm standing in front of him. He's got lots of windows behind him. And it turns out the Yemeni embassies started uh, using drones to try to surveil our conversations. Um, again, because it's an embassy, we could not go to the local police, uh, but we did get the diplomatic corps involved, and they explained that Dutch law says you can fly your drone over your own property, but you cannot fly it over to our property. And so finally, after several incidents of being surveilled by drones by the Yemeni embassy, uh, they actually stopped. And that was a very interesting uh, incident report I had to write for Saudi Aramco, because they had never heard of such a thing. Because uh, in Saudi, uh, the Saudi Aramco facilities are uh, compounds where they've got rocket launchers and things like that. The reason being is Saudi Aramco is a national oil company of Saudi Arabia. And it's got a unique threat profile where those compounds have, on several occasions, come under direct physical attack. Now, you may have heard of some of the recent attacks against Saudi Aramco involving uh, bomb-laden drones starting earlier this year and also a missiles being launched against them. So it's got a unique threat profile that most oil and gas companies do not have. Uh, we've even had a couple of our board members either assassinated or survived assassination attempts. <clears throat> so I got involved because I was in the middle of trying to eat lunch. And this is kind of a rarity where I almost never got to eat lunch because it was always some sort of emergency uh, going on. And I'm trying to eat a salad, eating a spinach salad, and a large man in a very nice suit comes to summon me. And I'm like, uh-oh, there's only certain reasons why I'm going to be summoned. Is there a family emergency? Did they find out that I might be mining bitcoins on those supercomputers? Or, you know, am I definitely, you know, being fired or something? And he's like, uh, no, you need to come with me. There's been a problem. I'm like, okay, what's that problem? And he goes, I'm, I'm, I'm not high enough to even know what's going on, but you need to come with me. So they take me directly to the embassy, and the problem is their email account's been hacked into, uh, their business email on the back end. Now, to make matters worse, the IT guy had just started. It was his very first week, and there was zero handover from the previous person. They couldn't even get a hold of the previous person. And I think a few of us have been in those situations where you are, you're in an incident and you're like, hey, I need some sort of handover, I need some information, and there's nobody to give you information. So you're kind of blind in this uh, situation. So I go, uh, all right, well, let's uh, start looking at securing some of this stuff. What's the password for the email? And we'll, you know, we'll secure it up. And he goes, well, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm like, Ex excuse me, could you repeat that, please? Because this is an embassy. I would not expect one, two, three, four, five, six. And indeed it was one, two, three, four, five, six. 
Um, so this was rather unfortunate. And it started because the uh, ambassador's secretary, she was supposed to be the only one that had permission to handle the emails. And some unusual emails uh, were coming back and forth, supposedly from her. And what had happened was um, a particular uh, Saudi national who was based in the UK uh, said, hey, I need a visa. And she did not know that visas were no longer processed at the Saudi Arabian embassy. They had actually farmed it off to a third party. And the reply she got was like, hey, why don't you send me 200 over to a MoneyGram account, and I'll expedite that visa for you. By the way, in the name of uh, a prince who happens to be the UK ambassador for Saudi Arabia. So this was kind of unusual, right? Yeah. How many people here think that MoneyGram is a legitimate way to transact money? Nobody, right? So this started setting off alarms, and Dr. Samaya actually contacted the ambassador himself to say, something's going on with your secretary, man. And so this started a timeline of communications back and forth, trying to figure out what was going on. And it was basically someone had uh, been able to get into the email and did, uh, you know, a man in the middle type of thing. So uh, I had limited access at this point in time because I am not a citizen of Saudi Arabia. So all I could do at that moment was uh, try to help them secure their email account as best possible. So about a week and a half later, I'm attempting to eat lunch yet again, the first time since the first event, and it turns out that it's not over. I get another summoning, the same guy in a different but nicely tailored suit, and I'm like, oh boy, I hope this is good news. I hope it is. Unfortunately, it was not. Uh, so it turns out that the attacker was still in the email system somehow, and at this time I did not know how, and suddenly the amount went up. So it wasn't just $200 to expedite a visa at this point. Uh, there was an email that was sent around to all of the GCC nations and to the country of Turkey that said, hey, if you give us $25,000 US dollars, it will save many lives. Uh-oh. So uh, the diplomatic corps, uh, without permission, although they were a very, very nice team, they were trying to be proactive, they ended up sending an email out to all of the uh, official back-end channel email accounts for all of the embassies in The Hague. And unfortunately, uh, they did not actually use BCC. Instead, they used... CC. So, because the attackers were still on, this is actually the uh, email where they signed it, and I just sanitized it a bit. It was nice that they signed it ISIS, because you knew exactly who you were dealing with. Nobody really wants to get that email, right? So, unfortunately, the attackers were still on the email system, and so they decided to go, hey, diplomatic corps and all the embassies in The Hague, uh, we're so glad that we have your attention now. We're going to start raising up the amount. And this is actually a sample of one of the emails that have been sanitized, uh, the actual email that they wrote back to the diplomatic corps and to all of the rest of the embassies in The Hague. So this was not the best move, and there was taunts uh, being sent to all of the embassies uh, that they were doing. And uh, so this started scaring the living bejesus out of a lot of different embassies. Uh, obviously, this is a major security concern when uh, all of a sudden this has just gone from $200 to all of the embassies being threatened. So then the particular uh, perpetrator started making matters even worse and ended up breaking into the ambassador's secretary's personal Gmail account. 
and then started sending demands and threats both against her, her family, and also uh, physical threats uh, against multiple individuals and started raising the amount up to 35 million or they would kill these particular people. Now, she was scared, so she did the first thing that most of us would do if you think you're being threatened by a terrorist organization. She might go to the police. Unfortunately for her, although we did uh, provide her protection, we had to get all of those matters shut down. Uh, so we asked very nicely that uh, all the police reports were closed so that we could handle it uh, by diplomatic means. Now, the big threat, unfortunately, came. This uh, is a picture of a landmark in the Netherlands. It is a hotel on the beach of Schrevening, if I said that correctly. Uh, and it's where all of the wealthy people would stay before airplanes where they had, like, cruises that they would take around the world and go all over the place with steamboats and what have you. And at this particular place, it's a beautiful hotel, by the way, uh, there was a threat that came directly. It says, listen, this is the final offer. You give us 50 million U.S. dollars, or Saudi National Day is going to be held at the Kerr House. Uh, there are all sorts of diplomats, ambassadors, and even parts of the royal Dutch family have been invited. If you do not give us this money, we are going to blow it up and kill everybody. And so the guest list included 432 people that were confirmed, and obviously, that was not a very good situation. It was at this point in time that the Netherlands National Terrorism Unit started getting involved and working with me. Now, my part with this was I was uh, the person that arranged basically everything as well as handled the incident and negotiated with the particular perpetrator. So I was the trusted individual of the ambassador himself dealing with all of this. So the ambassador started to suspect an insider. And because of the situation and the seriousness of this, uh, one evening after the embassy shut down, it was only myself, the ambassador, and his close protection bodyguards. And we ended up, uh, he started searching on his hands and knees, looking for credentials on like post-it notes in the dust, trying to uh, help me get into the suspect's computer system without the suspect actually knowing that they were under investigation. Because sometimes this is how you have to handle an insider who might be working with a terrorist group. Uh, so that it's never a good situation. On top of which, the suspect had full diplomatic immunity. So there was only certain things that you could do with this particular suspect. However, uh, I was able to one evening because uh, the ambassador uh, ended up trusting me so much, allowed me to bring embassy equipment back to my house uh, to search through, and after about a glass of wine, maybe two, uh, but about uh, within a half an hour, I was able to find that uh, there was an email forwarder set up for the suspect, uh, or the person that we thought was the suspect, and also when we shut uh, that person out, he started sending messages from various other email addresses, and I could use the header information and the hops and so forth. And I was able to actually trace uh, one of the uh, emails directly to geolocate it to the exact neighborhood that the suspect lived in The Hague. So it's pretty damning evidence, unfortunately, for him. Now, during this time, this took a very strange turn, even stranger than what had been before. There was a pub that I liked to go to in The Hague called Sherlock's. It was voted the best British pub in the Netherlands. I didn't even know there was a contest. And it was within walking distance, like two doors down. So, you know, of course it's going to be my regular. And uh, one day I arrived there at the pub. Because this, this whole incident, it wasn't just over one day. It was actually over about a two and a half month period. So it was kind of stressful, especially since I had to do all sorts of stuff for it. And there were three gentlemen sitting at the pub, at the bar, drinking tea. Now, the owner of the place, or the co-owner, uh, had told me that they had been there for almost three hours waiting just for me. So they gave me their card, and they are cultural attachés working for the Turkish embassy. And they want me, and only me, to give them English lessons. 
and they spoke perfect English, right? So uh, I, of course, had to report this, and uh, I was told to uh, continue engaging with these three individuals on a limited period while I had uh, people watching over me. And it was also during this point in time when security services notified me that they had found a list of top targets that ISIS wanted to uh, kidnap at the very least, and I was number two on that list. Um, so... I continued to give them English lessons uh, at the pub where they did not drink, where they spoke perfect English, uh, whilst uh, we were all four being watched from a distance. Uh, one evening, suddenly, all three of them, they just disappeared. And it turns out that security services notified me that all three of them had actually left the Netherlands. Uh, but before they left, uh, the day before, uh, the more senior intelligence person gave me a very unusual gift. Uh, I'm a lady, as you can tell. I'm a lady, Chris. And uh, I, I, I'm not Muslim, but uh, he gave me a uh, set of prayer beads, a very fine wood prayer beads, which I immediately handed in uh, to security services to get checked, of course, for uh, bugs or, you know, anything else, because uh, you, you never really want to take too many gifts from a uh, foreign government like that. So eventually, uh, we were able to, or I was able to close the incident, um, lock the, the perpetrator out. We we're pretty sure we knew who the suspect was, and uh, we did not pay any amount of money, zero. We never paid. Uh, now, there was some complications, and this is something that was handled by the ambassador and the country of Saudi Arabia. It had nothing to do with this. Uh, the particular suspect was from a rather prestigious family, and these are things that you have to tread very carefully with. So, uh, because of the diplomatic immunity and the fact that he was from a, a very high level family back in Saudi, uh, the Saudi Arabian embassy decided to reassign this particular suspect uh, to a very, very uh, physically dangerous location in the world. And within two weeks of being uh, reassigned, that person was also killed in a car bomb and was the only person that was harmed in that particular attack. So, yes. That's all I can say about that one. Now, I got a few cool uh, rewards out of it um, because it was a very stressful event, extremely stressful. Uh, when the ambassador was leaving the Netherlands, I was invited to his farewell dinner, which happened to be right in front of uh, the Dutch most famous painting called The Night Watchman in the Rijksmuseum and got a card, got a nice gift, all wrapped up, uh, which uh, I did get checked for bugs as well, you know, because you never know, right? You never know. So uh, I got some cool recognition, and uh, the gift did not have bugs, so I still have it at my house. Um, so that's good. Unfortunately, I was sick that evening, so I could not partake of all the lovely, very, very expensive wine that they were serving at the dinner, which is kind of a bummer. <sighs> but that's okay. Um, but yeah, so it was a very interesting incident, one that uh, I'm glad I don't have to uh, handle again, because it wasn't uh, very simple, and it was rather dangerous. So some of the lessons that I learned from this particular event were that uh, geopolitics can play a lot in cybersecurity, and I think all of us in this room are learning more and more about the fact that various digital attacks can be used by governments to do all sorts of things, whether it could be election manipulation, whether it could be cyber warfare or espionage or anything in between. Uh, another thing I like to stress is you might think that a simple email hack might be, uh, you know, just an everyday thing, but sometimes these things can turn out to have real-life human consequences depending on the risks that are involved with what's actually occurred. And in this case, it would have been a very, very bad thing if a lot, all of those dignitaries were killed 
or anything even remotely like that had happened. Uh, another thing, obviously don't trust gifts. If you get a gift from a foreign agent, always get it checked. Do not keep it in your house, right? Uh, just don't do that. Uh, try to prepare yourself. So if you ever find yourself in actual danger, I did kind of make this uh, mistake. I did not want my partner at the time knowing because I'm from a military background, so I can handle things in a different way than my ex-partner could. And uh, that was a very uh, interesting discussion we had two years after it happened. Um, you, you notice a discussion. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, also, uh, if you are in danger, then uh, a country can also use the next closest hop to you and use them against you. So you have to be aware of that. So definitely try to prepare your loved ones if you happen to do stuff like this. Uh, and also try your best not to panic and take uh, as many deep breaths as you can. Um, also, it's a great uh, tip in a business meeting even. If you pause for just a short time, people think you're smarter. Right. But, uh, you know, try your best to keep calm because you need to make rational decisions. And part of our job, especially incident managers, is a lot of times calming the chaos. You have a lot of people going all over the place, a lot of managers screaming because uh, they like to scream. Uh, but you really need to keep calm, and then they can see that, and they will calm down around you. So do that as best as possible. So I did try to save a little bit of time for questions because I do like questions. So I can keep improving it. Um, so any questions about this particular incident? There's got to be some. <laughs> any questions? I have a guy with the mic. It's not. It's on. Nobody, nobody's got a question. Everybody's just sitting there like... Mouths open, going, what the fuck? Um, yeah, I have a question, which is, what, how did the... Uh, you said that the, the guy in the pub knew that those people were sitting there waiting for you. Yep. How, did, how, did, how did he... How does the pub owner know that? Or, uh, because, they because they were asking. They were like asking... Who? When I came in, uh, my various movements coming in and out of the pub, how often I attended the pub, about what time I usually arrived, and what days of the week, and so forth, uh, asking for me by name, even though they suppose you know, no. we didn't know each other. So it was, it was quite unusual. But the pub owner knows your background, or just was like not phased that there's these three guys sitting there going, blah, blah, blah. <sighs> Well, at the time, the pub owner did not have a direct contact information. Uh, from then on, uh, he did, as did the other co-owner, and they would contact me or my office as soon as they arrived, and I would kind of keep them waiting for a little bit and to make sure that when I arrived, I had people who could watch over me because it was at that point in time that I was at a very high risk for kidnapping. And were you under permanent... Uh, guard yourself in that period? I was, but um, I don't particularly like uh, bodyguards being too close to me. So uh, they, I, I made agreements that they could watch over me but not be in my house and not be up in my business, basically. So... Okay, and you, you, uh, what I liked about this talk was at the end you're saying, oh yeah, incidents response, but I mean, this isn't like your typical... Is anybody else in the room, you know, doing some incident response and have like bodyguards and weird people turning up <laughs> at their, their local bars, uh, looking after, etc., uh, etc.? Et Any? Sorry? You've thought about. You've thought about what? Um, uh, I mean, it's it's incredibly scary, but uh, that your watering holes might be turned against you in that particular way, and. Um, I've only been to the Middle East like a couple of times and for very brief periods, but you do feel that type of surveillance. So uh, it's not surprising and it's scary. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I, yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I, I saw, I, 
My uh, very first job in the military was I was a military aviator. So I was one of the first uh, female uh, enlisted aviation who was allowed to go into combat. So I had seen a lot of very interesting and bad things already. So uh, I guess when you're a civilian or you become a civilian, you think that it's a bit safer, especially living in a country like the Netherlands. We don't have a lot of uh, terrorism or even that much crime except bicycle theft. By the way, somebody stole my bicycle on my last trip. I got to buy another bicycle. Did they know it was you? Huh? <laughs> Did they know it was you? <laughs> no, obviously not. Because yeah. if I find them... <laughs> Okay, so one last question. What the hell do you do to relax? <laughs> uh, well, I've been getting in. I, I think I might be becoming Dutch. So I've been uh, making how to cheese at home, beer and wine, and then I've got, don't tell anybody, a small still that when the wine doesn't come out very well, <laughs> I, I distill it. So, uh, yeah, that's what I've been doing on the side because I figured I needed a normal hobby that I could talk to non-technical people about because usually our dinner conversations, people would just get scared. So that's now surprising. I just say cheese. <laughs> so, yeah, and they're, they're fine with that. They're absolutely fine with that. Okay. <laughs> uh, anybody got any uh, further comments or questions? Yep. Ma'am, uh, I'm a forensics uh, investigator from Japan. There are so many uh, sectors that they were uh, announcing here, like uh, Yemen, for example, and the first talk about the Iranians, for example, and then the also uh, uh, other uh, countries like uh, Turkey, and then uh, one of the insiders is uh, Saudi Arabia. Two questions. Okay. When was the exact time that uh, you think that uh, you are being burned out for the, your identification as the investigator in this case? Well, I uh, had already been known as the person that was heading information protection because I had done a few talks as well whilst I was employed with Saudi Aramco family. And after the uh, email for 25000 was sent not only to GCC countries but also to Turkey, which is not a GCC country, uh, that is right around the time frame that the Turkish intel agents started coming to the pub. Second question is uh, the motivations for the attackers. Is a kind of blurt, money, terroring, or another push, uh, like uh, another scoop? Power uh, and religion. Uh, those were two big factors uh, behind this particular insider. So uh, we think that, uh, so I also, without the person knowing, uh, interviewed him on several occasions and he seemed to want to be in a powerful position. In addition to that, he had also said uh, some things that were contrary to your uh, typical uh, Sunni beliefs from Saudi Arabia. So uh, he had already displayed uh, behavior of more extremism. So he was um, unfortunately kind of in that belief system uh, that is not part of regular Islam. So uh, we are having uh, Olympics soon, so we, I'd like to learn about this stuff. What do you think about the skill set of this insider? He was not very skilled, and that's where um, the particular malware that was given to him that we suspect by the Iranian As government. operator. Yeah, because he was not that particularly skilled. So he was being uh, pushed and led by other individuals. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. Okay, uh, any further? Yep. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, we uh, mentioned briefly that it might be possible that um, a foreign agency, nation state, whatever, might try to use your uh, partner against you if they can't get directly to you. Is there any uh, kind of procedure to uh, counter that, if you can talk about that at all? Or uh, is that something like, well, we'll deal with it when it happens? Oh, no. Um after this particular event, there's been a few other events, uh, unfortunately. So there are certain code words, certain parameters. If I believe or I am notified that someone, uh, not a, a frenemy or an enemy, is keeping an eye on me, then uh, there are certain precautions and uh, certain things that we've actually tested out between myself and people very close to me. Um, and it's quite important to do that because ever since uh, January... Um, the, uh, 
Actually, for the past three years, the Iranian government has been trying to recruit me to go in country for a lot of money and teach them offensive security skills against critical infrastructure. Obviously, I did not go or I would not be here. And it finally culminated with the Iranian government uh, trying offering to send me a gift if I give them my home address. Yeah, seem, seems legit. Yeah, it seems totally legit, right? Um, so there are certain precautions and things uh, that I take, and I also have people very close to me who I think might be used as a hop also take at the same time, just in case. So, right. Thank you. Sure. There's got to be more questions. <laughs> What is a hop? You just well, mentioned that term. Yeah, I guess it's more of a military term. So uh, think of it kind of like networking uh, until your final thing, and that the closest hop to you is the closest person to you. Uh, so that's what a, a hop is. We still got time. There's got to be more questions. Yeah. I want to see hands. I, I, would show, I would show you your hands because you don't know what the hell's going to happen if you don't. <laughs> You don't know what the hell's going on in this room. <laughs> I had nine minutes. You've got nine minutes. I got so, nine minutes. Uh, as a personal thing, you say you come from a military background, et cetera, et cetera, but did you ever expect this kind of level of... Um, yes. Uh, I, I Unfortunately, um, yes, because... Um, so one of the things I had to do in the military was I also went through this thing called SEER training, which uh, came in handy because uh, at one time I was kidnapped and uh, held for ransom for a two and a half time week period, which was rather uncomfortable. Uh, so that uh, training definitely helped uh, with that particular situation. So, and, and how does that, if it's not too personal a question, how does that reflect on your? You meet new people. You you know. You said you you know you had this partner at the time, but how do you how do you treat when you meet new people? How suspicious are you of that? I can be kind of suspicious, and also it might be a reason why I'm I'm currently single because I think <laughs> I might intimidate certain people. But uh, yeah, no, I mean every situation is going to be new and different. But uh, I do have a level of suspicion that uh, yeah, definitely. You have spider sense? Well, it tingles. I've got Lady Chris sense. That's better, right? That's better. May I ask again about the forensic stuff, ma'am? How good they are tracing their, uh, you know, uh, uh, keep the, their f uh, footprints in the forensics? Oh, how much do I? How, how much uh, they are. The, attack, oh. the adversaries are covering their tracks. Is it good enough? It, it depends. All right. So sometimes uh, they'll be quite good. Sometimes they leave behind things on case? purpose. In this particular case, uh, we found the root kit by doing uh, packet captures on the network mm -hmm. and then able to find the root kit in that manner because we, unfortunately, the embassy at the time did not use antivirus. They relied on Microsoft um, Essentials. So there was no way to detect it on the local system, but we did full packet captures and sifted through those and found it. Because, yeah, uh, they, they, they had worse security than just the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. They had no security, basically. How about the SOC, SOC? They were not allowed to get involved, only myself. And uh, they are not uh, really doing much effort to cover in your ID. For it. Well, in this particular case, I was seen going back and forth uh, in and out of the Saudi Arabian embassy on a fairly regular basis. Okay. So unless, you know, there was, I don't know, it's on a public street. So so inside of that embassy, you, prob you probably already exposed well. Did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. Another thing to add is, uh, at the point in time when uh, the other countries were first extorted for 25000 I also was able to get evidence from those other countries. But when the diplomatic corps sent around the CC, every single embassy uh, then knew in The Hague 
uh, what was going on. So although it was still kept a bit private, it was still quite public uh, what was going on, at least in diplomatic circles. So, And one of the things that the ambassador did to assure a lot of these other embassies who were friends was to also notify them that I had been on the case. So... Uh, one last question for me then: the the embassy and the uh, the oil company they're they're happy with you explaining this stuff. Yeah, they're fine with it. I, I mean, I do have some people that don't particularly like me, but that's for other reasons. <laughs> so, so sometimes I piss off powerful people. I'll just stand over here. I think <laughs> we, I, we were remarking earlier. We didn't look, and we've never looked under this this podium. And I was thinking. <laughs> Yeah, before, <laughs> before this talk, I was like, "Yeah, maybe we, maybe we're fucking up here." Um, any more questions or comments? Or there's uh, bottles of whiskey and other things outside if you need to to deal with that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.